wrong number, I still will try if I can save it with my mother tongue. But this is my phone number for any of you who may be interested or need me for flight details, etc. My name is Chaya Kaufman. I'm from Eustate. I'm also from the um, Institute for Medical Research at Hadassah. So my laboratory is in the Haram campus. And uh, my field of research, and this is maybe one of the reasons why today and next Tuesday uh, are among the first ones in your course is because uh, I work on neurodevelopment and I love working on two different aspects of development, development of the skeletal system, muscle, vertebra, and uh, the vascular system, and mainly also on neurodevelopment. So I'll be touching on that just a little bit next week, but today we're going to talk a bit about development. So minutes of your time and please tell me what is your background and what do you know and maybe what do you not know on biology because I need this background to be coherent. So how many biologists do you have here? One I talked to you already or you know yourself? And the other guy? <laughs> Computer? Computer? Psychology? So you have some background. very difficult to read developmental biology now without entering a little bit of molecular biology and, and, and uh, biochemistry, so I, I'll try to do my best, okay? And if it doesn't suit your background, I'll change, okay, dear. So it, it depends on you, let us make it dynamic, okay? So uh, what I would like to do, first of all, is to give you a very, very tiny overview on development in general and on the uh, impact on the field of development. Because when we deal with brain development, and development of the nervous system in general, which is not only brain, may I say, it's not only work in the brain. But if you come to my lab or to other laboratories, you will be noticing that your body has a lot of nervous components, which are not less important than the brain itself. So we are going to call it nervous system in general. And evolution has a lot of impact on that. Why? Because if you take, for example, I don't know, a nematode, a, a worm, okay? The worm is composed of a nervous system which is spread throughout its body and has no, uh, the, the magic word, specialization, meaning there is no structure at the top or what we call the rostral part of the body which resembles even something like a brain. And this is, a, is an invention of the vertebrae. A very, very late invention in evolution, which enables us to concentrate, think about it, think about a worm and think about yourself, okay? It enables us basically to concentrate within a structure which is located at the top of your body, most of our senses, vision, audition, uh, olfaction, uh, touch as well, also touch is widespread throughout the body to an extremely limited extent, etc. But this has evolved throughout evolution. Now, if you think about embryonic development, you can find in the embryo many features that characterize evolution. And this is what is shown here. This is called the Heckenstein Treatise on the name of a German embryologist. I hope you all have this uh, presentation. I transmitted it to me to your following day. If not, just bring a sheet and I will So Heckenstein simply says what exactly cell means. The, the only thing for those of you who don't um, speak Hebrew, this is a fish, this is a salamandra, okay? A salamander, this is a turtle, this is a chick embryo, this is a rabbit, and this is a man for whatever, okay, it resembles or does not resemble us, this is the way we look when we are old embryos. So please do tell me what principles are hidden within this slide. Yeah. I need your help. Absolutely. So the first thing that is 
reasoning this derives is that at the early stages of development, which are depicted here in the upper part of the slide, this is later and this is a, let's see, a, a full-blown embryo, okay? We are all very, very similar. What are the similarities between these different species, which no doubt are absolutely different at adulthood, right? So what, what is similar here? Can you please tell me? What do we have that we don't have now? A tail. We have a tail. So whatever this means. We are not going to discuss that. This is a cord. I can give you a cord on, on this slide. Okay, but we are not going to do that. We have a tail. Next, what do we have? That we don't have now. All of these are vertebrate embryos. We, we don't have worms here, right? All of these are vertebrata. A fish is a vertebrate embryo, okay? We have cartilage of fish, bone of fish, but it's a fish, it's a, it, it had vertebrae, okay? It has a, a, an inner skeleton compared to insects which have an outer skeleton, right? Th give me another picture. Two seconds. <coughs> give you some of the rules. Not all of them apply to the nervous system, but many of them do, and I'll give you some examples right away before you actually enter into considerations of cellular mechanisms. So there are basic processes that concern most of the developing systems of the body. So my aim here is to integrate the development of the nervous system into whole body development, because we cannot we cannot make a difference. The nervous system is not the first to develop. The first system to develop as, as a system is the heart. Why? Why? We can live without a brain. We cannot live, uh, I mean, we, we need a medalla to drink, but we cannot live without, without a heart. So there are things which we need more than a brain, okay? We have a first brain, we have a second brain, which is the heart, and we, we leave it for next year. So, there are many different cellular processes that are important for development of the nervous system, as well as for development of the entire body. Let's give some examples. The first thing is 
with the specification of that. And I'm going to try to be very strict because of, uh, for the sake of those who uh, have no biological um, uh, background. Uh, cell specification is the process by which a multipotent cell, namely a cell which is able to generate many derivatives of your body, <coughs> becomes narrowed down, or is, we call it restricted in its space, to generate only fewer derivatives, and then upon proliferation, upon cell division, it will generate even fewer up to a single derivative, and at that time, we can call the cell a committed progenitor. A progenitor is a cell that is going to differentiate along a certain uh, route. Okay, and, and let me draw it for you. I think it's something that I like to do for medical students who like to see things in a graphical manner. And I'm sorry, uh, we, we don't have, I asked for a board, but it didn't arrive. Try to look at development as a kind of uh, pyramid, as a kind of triangle, sitting with its white side uh, on the top. So at the uh, top of the pyramid, we have the multipotent or totipotent cell of the body, which we call, Samson is nice, but I want the name, it's called zygote. The zygote is the fertilized egg, right? So let's go to the beginning of it. This is called the zygote, and the zygote basically gives rise to the entire organism, okay? Egg plus sperm generates a zygote after fertilization. But then, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have a neuron. For example, or obviously, we have differentiated cell types. I can speak about a neuron, a muscle cell, a liver cell, etc. For this course, we have a neuron, right? What is a neuron? What is a neuron? Let's define a neuron. I, I, what I would like to, to exercise here is the concept of a differentiated state, okay? A neuron, this is for me important, differentiated state. This is the concept, and this is the totipotent state. Now, a differentiated state for a neuron means, for example, that this neuron synthesizes acetylcholine, just an example, could be a gabaergic, glutamatergic, doesn't matter. It has, for example, an axon, it has dendrites, etc. And obviously, it functions as a neuron. It innervates a target. It transmits either motor, in, uh, motor uh, 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 information and so on, etc. So this is the end product of development, a differentiated state. Now, what happens between this state and that state? Between this and that state, there is a process that we call developmental restriction. That for many years, we thought exists, but we didn't have any measure for it. And let me just give you one example. We know now that a cell becomes specified, which is exactly the term that I wrote here, when it closes, it shuts off the transcription of certain genes. The transcription of certain genes means the production of RNA encoding a certain gene and on the contrary maintains or upregulates the transition of other sets of genes, which are specific for its final state. For example, if I'm going to be a neuron, at a certain point in development for some of the neurons, they will have to express, I don't know, neuro B, neurogenin, and so on and so forth. These are genes, these are transcription factors, which induce synthesis of target genes, which in turn will induce a cascade of biochemical and molecular events that will finally lead to the differentiation of the neuron. What is important here is that when a cell is a neuroblast, namely, and this is another point, not a neuron, but a neuroblast, then this cell doesn't seem, doesn't look morphologically different from any other cell in your, in your body as an embryo. It is not different. It is different only by virtue of the fact that it expresses this set of transcription factors. 
So therefore, this is specification and not differentiation. In this sense, differentiation is the expression, a factor of your specification problem. Are you, are you with me? I'll, I'll give you an example before we go on. Let, let's say you are a couple, okay? You, you're not married. You, are, you think that you're committed. Let me specify it. Committed to each other because you live together, because, I don't know, you love each other, etc. but you don't have any ring. Your family don't care about helping you with the class because you're not married, you don't have a certificate. But when you go and you marry, you have your certificate. Everybody knows you are a couple. Formally, you are a couple. So then you become differentiated because the world knows, okay, that you are together. So this is the difference between specification of all commitment and the actual differentiation state. This is a very, very important distinction. Why? Here, the term central came in. I, I don't think we are going to have time in these four hours that I'm giving to you to elaborate on that. But why is this important? Because for nervous system cells, we can go back from the neuroblast stage again to the zygotic stage, but we not, cannot go back from the differentiation stage. So there is a fundamental difference, which is different from other cells in the brain. We are not going to touch upon that because it's quite complicated. But there is a way back in the hierarchy of development from this stage up. However, there is no evidence so far that we can take a differentiated neuron, then differentiate it and go back in development to a more multifocal state. Neurons in this sense are extremely central. We can then differentiate a fully differentiated matrix cell by adding certain factors, it doesn't matter what, and go back with it towards a proliferated state, a state in which the cell will be a progenitor and not only be able to generate again matrix, but also dermis, you know, the, the underlayer of your skin, uh, fat tissue, and even bone, which all belong to the same class, right? But with a neuron, nobody has proven that this is still the case. However, with a neuroblast, the system is still plastic. Plasticity is another fundamental term in development. And in regeneration, again, a whole story on its own. So I think that by now, it, it's enough. We have learned about specification, differentiation, developmental hierarchy, description, a little bit about the meaning of what is plasticity, the ability to go up and down in our ability to play with developmental potential. So cell specification is extremely important in every system in the brain. You have a question. Yes, I just wanted to ask if the human brain is twisting, if cells twist in the capsule, upregulated and never turned on? Most of them are turned down. Yeah. And there are none that are turned on. Yeah, you well. have both of them. Okay. You have, it, it, well, this is, this is a whole field of research, cellular development, and we, we are also concerned. The way a, a, a certain cell, okay, is defined is normally by uh, a certain morphogen, by a certain growth factor, which is usually secreted from a cell and not at the distance. We are going to touch upon that in some time today. This elicits the transcriptional activation of certain factors, the transcriptional repression of other factors, and then the gain goes from the growth factor to the second line of transcription factors, which then interact among each other, both by repressive interactions, by activatory interactions, and then refining. So it's so complicated. But it's nice and we are beginning to define some of these things. This is actually amazing. Think about being one cell and creating a body which in terms of your form, of the order and sequence of development of your organ, of the way it begins functioning sequentially and not at the same time. How is this order created? Isn't this a beautiful question? So maybe all of you are coming to Okay, so second, second thing I wanted to say is cell proliferation. Cell proliferation, you begin with one cell and we are composed of mi billions and millions, I don't know even the number, of cells in the body. So we must 
first mass collision. I mean, a few minutes we are going to ask how do they proliferate in the neighborhood, or do they become bigger? Proliferation, ah, it's, it's mitosis. It's one cell, okay, that divides into two cells, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. This is proliferation. It's the term of cell division, right? It's this clear, cell division, but it's not only cell division. Cell division is one of the most complicated things in life because they have to divide in certain manner. They have to know when to divide, when to stop dividing. If they don't know, we get cancer. Okay, they have to know the way they divide. We can touch upon that. And they, along the nervous system, they divide differently. They are areas, for example, your brain, which divides enormously. Your spinal cord divides much less. This is why your brain is big and your spinal cord is small. Right? It's a huge thing which we are going to see. So differential proliferation, differential cell division is the name of the game in the nervous system and also in your gut. Do we, we have the, the, the small bowel? Okay, it's a couple of meters of bowel. But it begins with a small fluid. So this area of your small gut proliferates like crazy, whereas your stomach does not. And your large intestine, which is just something like that, does not comparatively with your small intestine. This is also proliferation, differential proliferation. This creates patterns. This creates different forms. And all this has to be tightly regulated in space and time. And I guess computer people like to get this um, a term. Okay? But spatiotemporal control is the basis of the game. Uh, epithelial mesenchymal or mesenchymoepithelial transitions, a very important concept. Most cells in development arise as an epithelium. What is an epithelium? Do you see if I write here? Most cells in development arise as an epithelium. An epithelium is a tightly arranged group of cells which express all kinds of cell adhesion molecules and all kinds of factors. It doesn't matter. They have a basal membrane. They, they have a lot of different identification. These cells are, are like soldiers. They sit like that. They are unable to move. They have polarity. This side is different from that side. But one of the things that happens in the embryo is that cells have to migrate. Cells have to move from the area where they are born to the area where they are going to form an organ. For example, all the innervation of your gut, okay, arises in the dorsal spinal cord, at the area of your neck, and at the area of your ass, okay? And these cells have to migrate enormous amounts of distances until they reach the gut environment, and then they settle there and form ganglia of the enteric nervous system. This is just one example. Most cells in your brain migrate. In order to become a migratory population, to acquire motility, cells have to undergo an epithelial to mesenchymal transition. They have to become mesenchymal. So this is epithelium, and this is mesenchymal. Immotile, this is motile. This is migratory. And this process is called EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal conversion or transition. Now, once the cells have arrived, for example, into a dorsal root ganglion and have formed a dorsal root ganglion, a sensory ganglion of the peripheral nervous system, they have to stop migrating. How do they do that? They begin reassembling those molecules characteristic of the early epithelial cells, and then they know that they have to stop. So they stop the migratory process, they reassemble together, and they create, they coalesce into a ganglionic structure. So this is a process which is exactly the contrary. It's a process of MET, mesenchymal to epithelial transition. Basic process in the development of the kidney, of uh, the liver, of muscle, of vertebra, and so on and so forth, and of the nervous system. Okay, not every ta every cell, but many of the cells. So cell proliferation, epithelial to mesenchymal, cell migration, and we are going to skip this because they are not so um, uh, uh, 
popular in the nervous system, but the last one is extremely important and yes, please.
phenomena, what he's referring to is that uh, in the olfactory bulb, you have cells in the subventricular zone here that are able to migrate in what is called the rostral migratory stream, the RMS, which leads you to the formation of more olfactory neurons, and this is basically something that occurs during adulthood. It's very important because we make it extremely important that cellular layers in the embryo, which develop sometime during developmental restriction, this initial cell proliferates a lot, a lot, a lot, and then it generates layers of epithelium at the beginning, which are called ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, and we are not going to talk about the others, but the ectoderm, which is this layer here, okay, that we have separated from the others in this skin, is going to generate two main things, the entire nervous system and your skin. The ectoderm, which becomes the skin, is generated by this layer. Now this layer becomes a little bit different at what we call the midline of the embryo, namely this area here, but let's skip that. What happens in the ectoderm is that due to certain mechanical signals, this is, it, this is how it would be lit, the ectoderm is a plate. And in fact, this plate is called the neural plate state, as it is written <coughs> here. Plate because it's the plata. It's, it's, a, it's a layer, a monolayer of cells. And then something happens due to the lengthening of the embryo that causes this ectoderm to round up on itself. And this process is called neurulation, which at the end leads to the formation of a tube so this is a plate, this is the neural groove because it has folded upon itself, and at the end, finally, it creates a tube, like a baguette, okay? But a hollow baguette, nothing in the tube. It's like I take out the inside to put my avocado inside, right? So this is how the entire nervous system is created. It's a hollow, simple tube of cells. Okay? And it is located between two extremely important structures. One is the upper ectoderm, which is going to be the skin, because this is going to be the skin, the lateral part of the ectoderm, that once the, ec the neural tube <coughs> forms, the ectoderm regenerates on its dorsal side. At the beginning, it is continuous. So I can draw a line which goes from the blue to the orange color. But then after the tube closes, the orange color separates. This is ectoderm or skin. This is the neural tube. I'll show you two images in a second. And this is the skin here. But then there is another structure, ventral to the neural tube, which obviously existed much before the neural tube has formed, which is called the notochord. Now this is maybe one of the most important structures in our body, in the embryo. The notochord is an organizer. It's a mesodermal structure. It's not, it's not neural. It's a mesodermal structure. It's a kind of rod that runs along the entire body up to a certain part in your brain, it doesn't matter which one. Why is it an organizer? You will see in the next hour that this notochord secretes a one, one factor, secretes many factors, but one factor that is important for the patterning of the central nervous system. And also of the muscle, it doesn't matter which. So that this hollow tube, which is so simple at the beginning, 
will become separated into these different colors. These different colors are different cell types, are different neuronal types. This is the weight loop. This is the neural groove stage. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a chick embryo. The way we work with it in our lab. And what you can see here are the following. Do you see it or I have to shut down the light to just for a second? So what you have here, and follow me because you're not going to see so many true images. This is the neural group. So this is the exoderm, which is going to be your skin. It continues with the neuroexoderm that is going to be the tube, and it continues with the skin. Right? So what is the difference between this and this? Look at this. The difference is that the neuroexoderm is thicker. Now, it is thicker but it is still composed of one single cell, namely a single cell, you'll see it in a few minutes, basically extends from the apical inner side to the basal outer side of this epithelium. But it is already at this stage different, it is restricted based on the usual exoderm. This is more resembling the primitive exoderm, but this has already been specified to generate only nervous tissue. So already at this time, even before we have a tube, we know that this region is unable to generate skin. However, if we give the proper signal, this region here is still able to generate a nervous system. Oh, yes, 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 I said specification. I didn't say full follicle. These cells are still progenitor. They are proliferating, they can still go up, okay, but only in the laboratory. They never do this normally. When talking about stem cells, I don't know if I have a chance, I said it sometime. Stem cells, many of the concepts of, much of the concept of stem cells is a laboratory based concept. It's not something that happens in vivo. The exoderm generates skin, what is this skin? Ah, the exoderm will generate the skin. At this time, this is an exoderm. It's one of the basic layers from the, the embryo is created from three germ layers. The exoderm generates nervous system and skin. The mesoderm, blood vessels, muscle vertebra. The endoderm, your guts and your lungs. Okay, amygdala. Okay, this is a simplification. So the exoderm is a single sheet of paper. Then the development it will stratify, it will differentiate, and it will generate the several layers of your skin. Your skin is a complicated very complicated. It's not simple. It covers the body, it gives you temperature regulation, and many, many features. So this gives rise to all of the layers of your skin. This gives rise to the entire nervous system, peripheral and central. So everything begins in like a baguette, a hollow baguette. Let's see how we continue. This is a stage in which things are a little bit more mature. So we are approaching the midline, okay, and we are about to close. So again, look at, it's very important. You cannot learn the developmental neurobiology without looking at this wonderful picture. Okay, again, deal with this. Exoderm. Look, look at the, look at this uh, junction here. This junction is composed of cells which are induced by interactions between exoderm and neuroexoderm, and they are going to generate what we learn in the lab, which is the neural cells, the entire peripheral nervous system for the brain. And they are generated exclusively here due to a crosscheck between exoderm and neuroexoderm. So this is the dorsal. This is dorsal, this is dorsal. Right, this is this lung. And then this is the neuroexoderm, and again the exoderm. What is the rest of the embryo? Just that piece, we have a cell. This is the notochord. Do you see this? It's a very tiny structure. It's like an appendix. It's a road. Now this road with development disappears. After it did its job, this is, this is the dynamics of development. In development, most of the structures are temporary. You need them to do A, they did A, they disappear. The notochord, once it has finished its, jo its 
Dog, disappear. Where does it disappear? In the inter interventricular disc of our vertebra. Inter interventricular disc of our vertebra. Okay? You, you have your vertebra here. Between vertebra, you have a disc. So it's that disc. Better? Within this disc, your muscle cord is going to disappear and it, it is going to form a, a, a structure whose name is not important. Nucleus cutis. Okay? Doesn't matter. But the muscle cord, this little step is so important because it patterns your entire nervous system. And here are the somites. These are mesodermal structures that will form the vertebra, all the masses of the body, all the masses of your hands and legs and so on. Extremely important structures. And finally, this is the endoderm here, which will generate your lungs and all the digestive system. Okay? Huh? Oh, this, uh, this is a two-day-old chicken egg.
nervous system to become dosamine in the embryo, and, and we are like a retrial. We have a difference here. Not only here, our face is a difference, right? Our face is created like that. And the fact that we have our nose here, our eyes, ears, etc., is because we did. Okay, this is the way an embryo is created. So, this is the beginning of closing, and, and at the end, this is going to be closed, and it's going to create another hollow tube, which is your intestine. All your gut is also created very similar to your neural tube, as a hollow, simple tube, before it's complicated. Okay, so just a few questions. And this is how it looks a little bit later. We have removed the skin here. This is the neural tube. These are the somites. This is the mesoderm that create the muscle. And what you are seeing here, that we are going to, to see again next week, these are crestes. These are the cells that were created in the dorsal midline of the tube, in the junction between ectoderm and neuroectoderm, and now they underwent the process of EMP and began migration. Why? Because contrary to the CNS, to the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, organizes outside the brain in the spinal cord. It organizes in your periphery. On both sides of your vertebra, you have all the sympathetic ganglia. You have the autonomic ganglia next to them. You have the parasympathetic ganglia in your gut and close to the eye and, and in additional regions. But outside your spinal cord and brain. So the neural tube is the primordium of the spinal cord and of the brain, and it also generates the neural crescent which are responsible for the formation of most, not all, I'm not going to complicate it, not all of the peripheral nervous system, as well as additional non-neural derivatives about which we're going to talk next week. Are we okay? Great, how many?
So there are different modalities of neurons going throughout your ventral to dorsal spinal cord. And this is what we are going to discuss a little bit, how is this formed? And you have another type of um, uh, neurons, which are called the preganglionic motor neurons that send the axons through your uh, peripheral nerve, which goes in this case to a sympathetic ganglion, an autonomic sympathetic ganglion also arising from the neural crest. Then it makes here a synapse, and from this ganglion postsynaptic uh, adrenergic uh, neurons go to your sweat glands, to your heart, to your intestines to modulate, for example, uh, peristalsis. If I have an exam and I have to go to the bathroom very quickly, or uh, my heartbeat is going to be increased or decreased, this is sympathetic modulation of uh, a nervous system which is intrinsic, either to the heart or to your gut. Okay, so the system is extremely complicated, but it is very precise, very pattern. So this is the spinal cord. Now, if we go to the brain, and, and just, just as a, we, we have at the patterning stage markers, molecular markers, that characterize these different dorsoventral areas, I'm not going to bother you with that. Let's go to the brain. The brain is a specialization of the neural system. Now, whereas the spinal cord remains very, very primitive as an epithelium, because the spinal cord is a tube, the brain has to grow because it has to accommodate many, 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 many neurons and the astroglia and oligodendroglia and microglia, which are the immune cells of your brain. So it grows by differential proliferation. One of those processes I mentioned in the list of processes that govern development. So what you see here is at the beginning, everything is a, a very simple field. This is the way development begins from simple to complicated. So this is, this is the message. Never mind if you don't know exactly how. So how does it begin? By creating vesicles, namely by differential proliferation, in addition to a tube, this tube generates three vesicles, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. At the beginning, three vesicles which are thicker and bigger than the other one. And this hollow part, this lumina, will become what? What do we have within the center of our brain? What does contain and produce the cerebrospinal fluid? The ventricles. Okay, we have ventricles. Okay, in the brain we have ventricles which are continuous. They are like a like like pipes. It's the pipeline of our nervous system. We have two lateral ventricles, a third ventricle, a fourth ventricle, and this is continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. It, it's the pipe, okay, um, uh, circulating and producing at certain areas the cerebrospinal fluid. So first you have three, three vesicles, and then this begins bifurcating. From the first vesicle, you will have two secondary vesicles, which are called the telencephalon, and then an additional vesicle, which is called the diencephalon. The diencephalon is the area from which your eyes will develop. The telencephalon is the area from which your cortex, among other things, will develop. The telencephalic vesicles will generate the brain hemisphere. And then the mesencephalon will become the midbrain. It's not going to change much. And the hindbrain is very complicated. At the beginning, it will generate two vesicles, but then it will generate eight vesicles in a row at different times. These vesicles are going to be called rhombomere because the hindbrain is also called in Latin rhombencephalon. Eight vesicles. And these eight vesicles are going to be segmental units that will pattern the formation of different nuclei of the brain. So everything begins by creating a pattern, very simple pattern. Within this pattern, differentiation of different neuronal types occur not only in the ventral to dorsal extent, but also in the rostral to caudal extent of the brain. So regionalization of the nervous system is an extremely important feature. 
there are signals which tell you, be the top or be the tail, and there are other signals which tell you, be dorsal or be ventral. Th this, is, this is the basis of the belief. So then, obviously, these different areas will generate the different uh, features and the different states of your nervous system. Let's leave it like that. You will have the, uh, the, the uh, presentation you can do. Now, another secret of the way of life. We are not made with the entire length of the embryo already done. The length of the embryo is laid down progressively during development and during a process which we were discussing here earlier, which is called gastrulation. Now, the pro this process, doesn't matter what it's named, is a process which causes the lengthening of the embryo with all its germ layers, endoderm, exoderm, and mesoderm. So, at the beginning, we have a disc. I'm looking at the embryo like that, a disc, like a matbea, like a, a coin, okay? Or a couple of coins on the germ layer, with an autocoin. <coughs> now, the first part of the brain, or of the nervous system to, lay, to be laid down, is the foreground. And then the embryo grows. This is something which is not just uh, exact because the embryo is longer and longer and longer. Then the midbrain, then the hindbrain, and finally the spinal cord, which grows to a long extent. So the nervous system is laid down, not the hindbrain or forebrain per se, but the primordia of what is going to become the hindbrain because the spinal cord, in terms of differentiation, forms before the forebrain. When the spinal cord, neurons, motor neurons are already there, the cortex is not formed yet. So this does not refer to differentiation of the system. This refers to the formation of the primordia, which will generate at a second, third, or fourth stage the actual neurons and actoglia or glial cells of the different parts of the brain. And this is due to the fact that our entire body is progressively made. We have first a neck, but we don't have a tail. And progressively we have more and more and more. So the principle here is that the entire embryo, I'll answer your question first, the entire embryo, including the nervous system, the nervous system is not different from the rest of the embryo, are laid down progressively in a rostral to caudal sequence. So if I stop development at a certain time, I will never have hind limbs. I will not have legs. I will only have wings or arms. <coughs> okay, the legs or the area of the body which will generate the legs will come later. This is the principle of rostral caudal development of the embryo, which includes the nervous system among other, uh, uh, among other things. Okay? But it's important that when you go back to this slide with Ever, don't think that the forebrain is formed first. Okay? It's the primordium, the Hanistan, or what we call in, in German, for those of you who know German, the Anlage, which is the, the, the very good uh, old word for that, because most of it has been basically laid down by German embryologists, very famous, very talented ones. Okay, n let's go to proliferation. I said that this is a pseudostratified epithelium. What does this mean? That the entire thickness of the epithelium is formed by one cell. Now, why is this thicker? Because the nucleus of the cell is in here. This is why it looks more shaman, thicker. If I draw this to you, because it is important, it will look like that. If I draw this, you know that each cell has a nucleus, right? And a cytoplasm. So the cell will look like this. If this is the neural tube, let's say this is the lumen, a cell will be like this. 
scan the entire thickness. Now, it will be thicker here because the nucleus is big. So it will look like that. But, and this is called substratification. Why stratification? Because stratification for the skin is many layers of cells. Why does it, it is called pseudo because it's <coughs> only one layer. But based on the stage of the cell cycle at which a cell is located, it will look at if it, if it, if it is stratified. Namely, if I look at this, I will see one layer, two layers, three layers, and I will think that it is stratified like the skin. But it's not true. This is why it's called pseudostratified, because it's only one cell thickness. But the nucleus migrates. It moves from the apical part to the basal part. Why does it move? Because mitosis, actual cell division, namely one cell which divides to generate two cells, will only take place in the apical domain of the epithelium. Only here will you have mitosis, the end phase of the cell cycle. And only here will you have DNA replication, namely the X phase of the cell cycle. You know that DNA has to replicate from 2N to 4N chromosomes before the cell divides. So the cell goes from replicating its DNA, then the nucleus goes back to the luminal area, and then the cell will divide. So this has a name, and it is important. It is important. It is called interkinetic, one word, okay? Interkinetic nuclear migration. It's of course not a migration at the level of a cell, it's migration of the nucleus within a cell. The nucleus moves, but the cell is always attached to both ends. And people claim that it is only when the cell goes on into cell division that there is a detachment of the cytoplasm. But now we know that for most cells this is not true. It's because the imaging techniques did not enable us to see that even cells undergoing division will replicate the entire cytoplasm and at least some cells, not all of them, will retain their cytoplasmic shape to the basal side of the epithelium. So pseudostratified epithelium, concept number one, which involves interkinetic nuclear migration, namely apicobasal migration of the nucleus, which follows the state of the cell cycle at which the cell is localized or transits through, and this is important for proliferation of the cell. Okay, so this is what this slide shows to you. So now it's not going to be news. This is exactly interkinetic nuclear migration. This is the ventricular or apical zone, the lumen of the tube. This is the marginal or basal area, and there is a single cell all the time here, and the nucleus goes from apical to basal, back to apical. The cell will divide here, as you see, and then we generate the axon, or it's not an axon, sorry, the basal, the basal uh, uh, cytoplasmic shape. And as I mentioned, this is not true anymore. This is not true anymore for most of the cells. It has been seen in the cortex and in the retina, at least, in zebrafish embryos, where movies are very easy to be taken in the zebrafish, not in, in higher vertebrates, and it is known that basically this exists all the time. Okay, but this is taken from, I don't know, this is news from two, three years ago. So this is how it looks. Okay, you can see the cell piled up like a stratified epithelium, one cell on top of the other, but this is not true. It's one cell at time. This is why it looks like a multi-nucleated system, which it, which it is not. Okay, how do cells proliferate? At the beginning, we need to make many cells. Many cells that are identical to their mothers and fathers. This is called cell or stem cell renewal. And this is exactly this principle. You have a cell. This cell will generate two cells which are identical to the mother cell. 
So this is called, and, and then it will generate the cell which is different, but this is called cell transition. So there are two processes, and this is the principle of stem cells. There is stem cell renewal, which we call symmetric cell division. Symmetric cell division. Why? Because again, it generates two cells identical to the source. And now, this is called asymmetric cell division. It's not written here, but basically the idea would be that it generates one cell like this and another cell like its parent. So, at a certain point in development, a progenitor will generate a cell that will go towards differentiation, will leave the cell cycle, will become post-mitotic, will be unable to proliferate any longer, but it will also generate another dotted cell that will continue proliferating. This is called asymmetric cell division. It's not, it's not here. Let me draw it and I'll answer your question. So the idea is we will have one cell which will generate first two cells exactly like this. This is called symmetric cell division or um, cell-like cell division or whatever, but then this cell can either generate again the same or can generate a neuroblast and again a cell like this. Now these two cells, which are generated by symmetric cell division, can be already neuroblast or can be cell cells. So symmetric division can generate again stem cells or generate already progeny that will differentiate. So a neuron can be generated either by symmetric cell division or by asymmetric cell division. Can be. The, the student comes first.
el hombre aplica el domain, el vehículo al domain of the decision, generate an horizontal type of mythology, of division, which makes that one cell is opposed to the human and the other one points to the basal domain, then you can argue that the different environment of those cells, of those two daughter cells, namely being in contact with the lumen versus not being in contact with the lumen, will already provide an environmental mechanism or a cell-cell interaction-based mechanism that will make them different. So clearly, both mechanisms exist. If we call environment cell-cell interaction, then this is very popular, the mechanism, but also the cell determinant. And we know of many of this kind and of that kind. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to talk about it, but let's show it to you. So cell de if this is a determinant of a cell, we, we are not going to give it a name. The, the violet determinant, if cell division takes place in this orientation, then both daughter cells will inherit this determinant symmetrically and both daughter cells will be similar. If, on the contrary, cell division changes the plane to become vertical, then only one daughter cell will inherit this determinant. And let me show it to you like this. Okay, so these two daughter cells will be equal, these two daughter cells will be unequal. And let me show you this little movie which, in which this cell has been saved for one of those determinants. Okay, and let's see what happens during cell division. one of the cells has inherited this determinant and when they will fully physically separate, this cell is going to be different from that one. This is a deterministic process, okay, but there are many stochastic processes based on uh, the mode of cell division, etc. The mode of cell division isn't stochastic either, but it's, it's more statistically, more randomized than this. And let us see what happens. These are the two modes of cell division in a picture in vivo. So what you see here is a cell that whose nucleus is reaching the lumen. You see it here. You see how it divides, okay, and how the two daughter cells come up to create new epithelial cells. So this is this type of cell division, which is symmetric. Here we have an asymmetric cell type of division. For example, look at the cell. It comes to the luminal side. It divides like that. One cell remains here, and the other one goes there. So one cell goes up, and the other cell remains as a stem cell or a progenitor cell to regain another cycle of migration and go on. So symmetric cell divisions generate more progenitors, account for the growth of the system, and asymmetric cell divisions are differentiated cell divisions. They are responsible for the transition into differentiation. So basically, statistically speaking, at the beginning, most of them are symmetric because we have to account for a, a rapid growth of a system. And then with age of the embryo, the number of symmetric divisions will drop and the number of asymmetric divisions will increase. Okay, so this is quite logic, no surprises on this side. Now, these cell divisions are very different in the brain and in external cells. In terms of how the daughter cells will migrate throughout the thickness of the epithelium, which is increasingly growing all the time, and generate neurons and glia. The glia are Obviously, neurons are responsible to generate fibers. The gray matter is neurons. The white matter in the brain and spinal cord is fibers. So in the spinal cord, you know that the gray matter is at the inner part of the spinal cord, and the white matter, namely the fibers, are localized outside. In the brain, in the cortex, it's exactly the opposite. Why is it like that? Because of the differential type of migration of the cells, once they leave the cell cycle, once they finish migration, 
For example, this is the case of the spinal cord and the medulla, which is the lower part of your brain. You have a cell. It creates a blue cell. Now, the red cell, which is younger, is in between both. These are the progenitors. This begins to be already the neuroblast. Next, then, a, a new cell, the yellow triangle comes up. And it is localized close to the progenitor, etc., etc. Then this cell begins differentiating, it creates fibers. And then this is the end. What you have is what we call an inside out mode of migration and of differentiation of the neurons, so that these are the different layers of the neurons, and this is your white matter. which is composed of the fibers of these cells that have been laid down in this manner. So this is older, this is younger. And these cells, which at the beginning of development were the new epithelial progenitors that proliferated, at the end will become a sort of cells, a type of cells that are called ependyma. The ependyma are like glial cells which line the ventricular wall. So at the beginning they are progenitors, at the end they will become dependent. Okay? This is the opposite of what happens in the cortex. Because in the cortex you have your progenitors, then a blue cell is formed, another blue cell is formed, a red cell, the yellow cell is out. It goes through, it, 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 it is arises, arriving here because all the cells are born here. We know that already after mitosis. So the cell is born and then it crosses through the other cell to adopt a more superficial area. So our cortex is born from the inner side towards the outer side. So cell migration will bring more cells into a superficial layer. The younger cells will be superficial. And then when these cells begin, a basal versus apical. Inner is apical. Remember the baguette. Remember the baguette, the hollow baguette. Inner is apical. Outer is superficial, basal. Always think about the epithelium. Okay? This is inner. Here will be the ventricle. And this is outer, the outer part of your brain. So the outer layers of the cortex will be younger in terms of the time of birth of the neurons than this one. These ones will be the older ones, these ones will, will be the younger ones. There is an opposite polarity of organization of cortical neurons, hypothalamic neurons, etc., when compared to those of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a much more primitive area of your body. This is evolution. Okay, this is evolution. The brain is new, the spinal cord is old. So, when you go to the neuroanatomy laboratory, in my floor, and you open the brain, you see that in the cortex, the white matter is inside. And the gray matter are these six layers of cortex. Very tiny, one millimeter, but six layers. Yes. No, 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 no. These are neurons. This is, this is a skin. It's a complicated skin because why do we have these blue cells here? In the cortex, we have a very specific type of neuron. doesn't matter, the cajal reflex neuron, which lay down the organization of the cortex. And these are primitive cells that are laid down and remain, even in the cortex, they are early born but remain superficial. This is an outstanding feature of the, of the brain. It is outstanding compared to this inside out type of organization. They are known to pattern the brain. Okay, the cajal reflex cell, which is the inside out, the cells migrate through this radial glia, never mind, we'll skip that. These cajal reflex cells organize the, the uh, layering of the brain and basically express a protein which is called relin. Okay? And if you have a mutation in relin, instead of having this normal patterning, you will have a mess. 
Okay, this is the importance of those neurons, blue neurons that we mentioned there. Okay, let's finish our day by talking a bit about diseases. Now, it's not that I like talking about diseases, but it is important that through the formation of malformations of the brain, we learn about the mechanisms of normal control mechanisms. Are you with me? Do you think so? talking about diseases because it's interesting at the level of understanding genetic mechanisms and therefore we are going to talk in two seconds about one molecule called chronic age of, which is the morphogen released by the nosocomial and this is the molecule that organizes your nervous system from spinal cord to brain okay morphogen in, in two seconds tell us the meaning The first thing that I would like to mention is that we were talking about migration. Migration and proliferation of cells creates layers. And in the brain of humans and of monkeys, to a lesser extent, you have gyruses and sulci, right? Okay, all these beautiful things that make our brain right. Why do we have gyruses and sulci? Do you know? to increase the area, the volume to area ratio of your brain in order to accommodate more and more neurons within a given volume, right? Because the volume of our heads is not that bigger from that of monkeys, but we have many, many more neurons because we have a brain that has many more convolutions than that of monkeys, certainly of chicken neurons and of mice, right? So this is a patent, an evolutionary patent of making convolutions which are a direct result of having more proliferation and more cell migration. Now there is a disease, there is a disease in humans, and of course we have mouse models already, which is called lisencephaly. Lis in Latin and in Spanish, my mother tongue, is a flat, a halak, okay? Smooth, not flat, smooth. A smooth brain. Now the genes have been cloned, two genes are mutated, one of two possible genes are mutated in this disease, and it, this is the lisencephaly gene one, and lisencephaly gene two, lis one and lis two. When children get affected with a lis gene mutation, their brains are smooth. They are not convoluted. So lisencephaly, smooth brain, rare gene link brain malformation, characterized by the absence of normal convolutions in the cerebral cortex, abnormally small head, microcephaly, caused during embryonic development by defective neuronal migration. Why? Because the LIS gene encodes molecules that are motors of migration. And menin et they, they drive the cells to move from the ventricular area towards the basal side. This movement that we have been looking at in the previous slide. This is why I brought you this disease. So if you cannot move, okay, your brain is not going to create all the patterns and all the convolutions and you're gonna have a smooth brain. Unusual facial appearance, difficulty swallowing. Obviously this is not due only to brain malformations but also to the defects in neural crest cells which form in the head all your facial bones in the form of your, uh, of your cranium and your face. So crest cells not only give rise to peripheral nervous system, also to many bony features which are not going to discuss today. Muscle spasm, seizures, etc., etc. Not good, not good. These children do not survive. Look at this. Here you have a normal brain. Obviously white matter outside. Seda? And you see here all the convolutions. These are the gyruses and these are the sulci, the, the, the
the invagination. Look at the lead encephalic brain. You see? Barely, barely convolution. It also to the old people, it looks very similar. If I look to the MRI, it's like very old people. It's very really? They are lead encephalic? I, I doubt they are lead encephalic. No, but it's, there is no other convolution. It's, it's very smooth. Like the I, I, I doubt it a little bit because I have like 15 years of neuroanatomy courses, and most of the brains we analyze are brains of very old people, and they look very convoluted. They look very convoluted. I don't know exactly what you mean. I'm ready to discuss it. Okay. Yeah, I don't know whether the resolution of the MRI is so good, okay. it should be, but the brains are convoluted. This is not a feature. Obviously, our brains lose so many neurons every day, but I don't think to the point that this will influence the <coughs> basic pattern of convolution. You, you are invited to come to us and, and look at one of our brains. Most of them are old, lucky for us. Still keeping uh, things. Uh, Mark, I'm, I'm still scared that today there are some holes in it. Is there another potential? Oh yes, they are. They, they are more genes. Uh, the lead encephalic gene acts together with the gene which is called double protein and with dimer motor. Uh, it's not a fully phenotype in the child. Okay, so you still have some free cell. This is why these children are able to think, but they are mentally retarded. Most most of the mutations are not fully penetrated, right? Mm -hmm. We have some redundancies in the brain. Can you detect the disease by an embryo stage? And this ultrasound at a certain point will give you some resolution of uh, convolutions in the brain. Some resolution. Because, but it's not because of the convolutions that you will detect the disease. It's because of the, um, of the features of your cell. This will bring you to the thinking, if you are a gynecologist, that there are problems also in terms of, uh, and this will lead you to genotyping, okay? Uh, Etc. It's, it, it's not the features of the brain that will say there is a disease. The only things that are easily detected in ultrasound are hydrocephaly, a lot of liquid, a lot of cer cerebrospinal fluid, which leads to your brain being very thick mm -hmm. instead of having a normal thickness. This is easily detectable in ultrasound. The convolutions may be, but then the, the embryo is a fetus already, and it has maybe six or seven months, and then you cannot abort. Then it's gone. You have to induce premature death, which is a completely different story, right? But you can detect facial abnormalities, which are quite easily to be detected in a good ultrasound. At, uh, At what stage? I would say two months and a half, three mm -hmm. months. But you know, women undergo two in Israel, at least many, many, many years. Yeah. Having a baby is a problem. Mm -hmm. So you undergo. A very, very early, a vaginal ultrasound when there is virtually nothing. Then you undergo a second one at about three months when things are very critical. And then you undergo it, uh, this is the 17-18 uh, week one, and then at 24 weeks or something like that, which is a morphogenetic period, the growth period. And it is then when you detect things that are not detectable before. But then at that time, it's premature death. It's not, uh, abortion is up to two and a half The rest is, is um, quite shocking for everybody. Okay, should we continue? So, lead encephaly, lead one, lead two, convolution. Not the diseases is what matters here, but the fact that the cell has to proliferate, migrate, and be patterned in a very specific and precise manner. Any movement here and there from this precision will lead to disease. And obviously, mutations will be. Now we come to Hester. How much time do I have, Missy? And how? Uh, otherwise, we will not touch upon network and we'll continue this next week. Next week, Paul, Nancy Shavuada? Up to you. 